Welcome to episode 128 of Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius, who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with our panelists on the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the ancient Epicurean text, and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com, where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. This week, we're going to take a detour from the letter to Pythocles while both Joshua and Don are away. For this one week only, we'll discuss the 12 Fundamentals of Nature. Now let's join Martin reading those for us. 1. Matter is uncreatable. 2. Matter is indestructible. 3. The universe consists of solid bodies and void. 4. Solid bodies are either compounds or simple. 5. The multitude of atoms is infinite. 6. The void is infinite in extent. 7. The atoms are always in motion. 8. The speed of atomic motion is uniform. 9. Motion is linear in space, vibratory in compounds. 10. Atoms are capable of swerving slightly at any point in space or time. 11. Atoms are characterized by three qualities, weight, shape, and size. 12. The number of the different shapes is not infinite, merely innumerable. Okay, Martin, thank you for reading that. It's just going to be the two of us today. Don and Joshua are unable to attend, and so we'll just have a little bit shorter than normal uh, podcast today and go over and take a detour back into some very fundamental physics. We're in the middle of the letter to Pythocles in general, and our next section in Pythocles is going to be the issue of the size of the sun. And we've had a lot of recent discussions about the size of the sun and the significance of that issue and some very deep subtleties about the conclusion and the way it's stated in the Epicurean philosophy that there's a lot of epistemological issues involved in the choice of Epicurus not to designate the size of a sun in terms of a certain set of inches, feet, miles, whatever, but just to say that it is as it appears to be. But we're going to defer that so we have both Don, hopefully, and Joshua and Martin and everybody of the team here who'd like to participate so we can really dig into the canonical, epistemological issues of the implications of of looking at the size of the sun in that way. So today, since everyone else is unavailable, it's just going to be Martin and I, and we're just going to take a brief detour back into what is understood to be a book, scroll, writing, essay that Epicurus put together called The Twelve Fundamentals. It's totally lost, and there's not even any fragments that I'm aware that anybody has attributed to this book, but it's referenced in Diogenes Laertius, and it seems like most commentators have decided that there was a scroll devoted to sort of a summary of the key principles of Epicurean physics. And so what people like DeWitt or Diskin Clay and probably some others have done is they've gone back into the letter to Herodotus and compared it to Lucretius, especially book one and two of the poem, and they've correlated these observations about physics to try to pull out of those a number of these basic principles 12, I guess, is the number that's thought to be the right number, but I think some of the lists are only 10, whatever. And and there are significant differences of opinion about what was included and what was not. And so we definitely have to keep that in mind. This is a recreation. The summary that Martin just read is something that Norman DeWitt himself put together. There's not Latin or Greek text in those exact words but it's a summary that he's put together. And it does come pretty close to what Diskin Clay, who has written several essays, I think there's one called Paradosis and Survival. There's one called Lucretius's Translation of Greek Philosophy. And the essay that I've read the most myself is called Epicurus's Last Will and Testament. 
in which he goes through and does the same thing DeWitt does. He goes through Lucretius, goes through the letter to Herodotus or other locations and attempts to reconstruct this sequence. So as we talk about it today, I would refer people, aside from those articles of Disc and Clay that I just referenced, the major reference point in Norman DeWitt's Epicurus and His Philosophy book is on page 156, and there's some other significant mention on page 214 as well that we can talk about as we go through here. But aside from just the obvious correlation that you can tell from the order that everyone puts these in, that the first one is nothing comes from nothing, and the second one is nothing is reduced to nothing, DeWitt says matter is indestructible. Those are so clearly stated so quickly in Lucretius that there's not any real doubt about reconstructing those. And in fact, the first seven or eight, at least, maybe even nine, are beyond a whole lot of dispute because they're set forth so clearly in Lucretius. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing goes to nothing. All you have is solid bodies in void, and the solid bodies are either compounds or simple those things are pretty clear. But the main thing we want to talk about is just the significance of any kind of a list like this and why it's important to be able to at least remember the most basic aspects of it from Epicurus' point of view anyway. So one of the things we talk about on the forum as much as anything else, and the point that DeWitt really makes in his book very strongly, is that these doctrines make it largely impossible to accept assertions like Plato's realm of ideal forms in which something eternal is out there, in which there's an idea of a horse or a form of a horse that exists in some other dimension or any kind of a supernatural religious-based orientation. If there is nothing in the universe except atoms and void, matter and void, if the matter is constantly moving around, if there's nothing outside the universe other than everything that exists, which is atoms and void, then there's no other realm, no supernatural realm, no realm of eternal forms that can be reflected or into our universe or that we need to somehow get outside of our universe in order to come into contact with and understand them and, and apply them. And I think really basically that's the essential point that has to be understood is that the whole point of the physics in the first place is to establish what our conclusions are going to be about supernatural realms and things like that. Martin, would you agree that that's the general ultimate point where yeah, we're going? That, that at the end, yes. But the one at the beginning that there is no dispute, if you read it, the first two from David and the first two on Disk and Clay are different. So mm -hmm. you can conclude from the first two of David uh, that then uh, the first two from Disk and Clay are correct, but not the other way around. So the, the, the ones from David are more narrow. And the question is now, can we really trace back a crisp statement like David comes up to, to some source that at least somewhere else, uh, this is stated in a way uh, that, that it, it's equivalent with matter is uncreatable and, uh, and matter is indestructible, or is, are the sources we have rather tend to support uh, what this can clay writes. On the other hand, it may be that clay formulated his things in, in a way uh, that, uh, that it would be more compatible with modern physics. And of course, that is uh, also then cheating. Né? So, so the question is, what can we back up with uh, actual sources? Uh, is, are these David's take on the first two or this can clay's? Yeah, that's a huge point that everybody has to keep in mind, that all of this is reconstruction and the opinion of the person who's reconstructing it. And the first thing I'd say to support what you just said about the difference in, in number one between DeWitt and Disk and Clay is that when DeWitt says matter is uncreatable, it's kind of like, why do you even use the word create? The more broader way of saying it is comes into being whether it comes into being by a creator or not. Disk and Clay's is a broader statement. And if I'm correct, I think that Disk and Clay's is more exactly what Epicurus says in the letter to Herodotus. What probably, again, it's always with do it, you're always having to think about whether he's extending it to a logical conclusion or whether he's being literal or not. What DeWitt's, to my mind, is more reflective of is what Lucretius says, because Lucretius specifically says that nothing comes from nothing by the will of the gods. 
Lucretius actually links that principle doctrine number one to by the will of the gods as if he's in the context of discussing specifically whether the gods created everything or not. Whereas in the letter to Herodotus, Epicurus, I don't think is quite that narrow. You're right. Even the very first one is different among these two. And it's important just to understand the perspectives that might explain that. What about the number two? I can comment on the uncreatable and the number one. I know that there's a difference between Lucretius and Epicurus on that. Do you think there's any difference between Lucretius and the letter to Herodotus on item number two, Martin? I don't know, about- but it's the same difference or the similar difference as between mm-hmm. one of David and one of Clay. And now we have this, the same thing between the, the second one of David and the second one of Clay. No? So they say something else. It's similar, but it's not the same. Right. So you're always having to kind of move back and forth between levels of analysis here to think about whether there's a reason why things are stated. Maybe it reminds me of the issue of when you're growing up, at least in the United States, among certain people, you're going to hear that the King James Version of the Bible is the only one that that's just straight from the Word of God himself. But of course, as soon as you begin to understand that, of course, it was not written in English, there's written in several different languages, and there's all sorts of variations of translation, you begin to realize that you've always got to use a certain amount of intelligence in and reconstructing from other languages what the basic point is. I don't know that I think either of these basic points is really wrong. They're kind of from different perspectives. I've heard people say Clay's version is more rigorous, and he probably is more literal. So that's a good example, Martin, of how you have to treat these carefully. It bears repeating again, there is no good original version of this that we can look to. So what we're basically end up doing, whether you're DeWitt or Clay or anybody else, you're basically going back to these basic physics texts, and you're just preparing an outline of the important points that you think should be pulled out of. So it'd be pretty dangerous to want to just memorize DeWitt's wording versus Clay's wording, and not many of are going to be able to memorize the Latin or the Greek, but the basic points do add up, I think, to something that makes a realm of eternal forms to be impossible to consider to be valid. The other thing that's really important for us to address, Martin, would be this issue of the first thing that DeWitt says on page 157 about these principles is we have to think about the issue of are they being established through reasoning, deductive reasoning maybe, or are they established through observation? And what's the relationship between the observation versus deduction in setting these out? Which, before I get you to comment, reminds me of the really important point from Diogenes Laertius. He made the comment that the Epicureans tended to combine discussions of epistemology with discussions of physics which I think does make a lot of sense because you almost have to start with both of them together and bring them together because you're not going to be able to talk about physics and your observations unless you have a theory of epistemology or theory of knowledge and how to assemble things into knowledge. And on the other hand, you're not going to really have a firm opinion about the best way to assemble things into a conclusion if you don't take a position on sort of the nature of the universe. So it seems like the Epicureans, and we see it in Lucretius especially, that the discussion is combined or at times assumed. And Lucretius doesn't even start talking about basic epistemological issues until I think it's book five when he talks about illusions and knowledge and so forth. So Lucretius just basically jumps into this discussion of nothing comes from nothing. But he does it by talking about examples of things that you can see around you. Martin, you got any comment on, do you discuss epistemology? Do you discuss the senses and the means of forming knowledge first? Or do you discuss physics and observations of atoms and void first? Or do you have to combine them? Hmm. We don't have to combine them. Just one needs to be somehow aware of the other one to make sense. And I guess without getting too picky and so forth, how do you ever get to the point of being aware of the other? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg, is the cliche. What's the very first thing you would teach to a child, for example? I mean, obviously, we can put together today presentations and essays that focus on epistemology, and we can 
put together those that focus on physics, but this issue of them being consistent with each other. As adults, we just kind of assume things that maybe should not be assumed. But I think pretty much in both Letter to Herodotus, it's just at greater length than Lucretius, that he gives the principle and gives the reason for it pretty quickly after that. For example, with the nothing comes from nothing principle, Lucretius goes, I think, several paragraphs with examples of why we deduce from observation that this is true. So you can lay out the principle of physics, and then immediately you're going to be establishing the truth of it through citation to the senses, which you have to also understand is your valid method of proving something. He could have said nothing comes into being out of nothing because Zeus says so. But instead, he says nothing comes from nothing, and then he lists a series of observations that would establish that or would tend to support that. And at least in one of those questions that we've discussed before in terms of certainty and so forth, how many observations do you need to make in order to say that you're confident that something is proven and then move on to the next one? I guess that's your canonical or epistemological issue. Bob? And that then comes in that we have a model or a theory. So, so because if, if you just stay uh, there at the phenomenological level, you cannot give a number. You just have no clue by what, by what to measure it. So, so but what the way this is normally done is so that you formulate a theory and then a crucial experiment with which you try to refute the theory. And if all attempts of refuting it fail, then you accept that model or theory. So, so this is how it actually works. So it's not that you say you need 100 observations which match and none which is against. So, so it, uh, it, it, that is not enough. A hundred is not the key number, but what is the key number? How many do you really need would be the question. There is no number because you use a different method. And how do you decide when you've got enough? How do you decide when you've observed enough? The thing is that you create different types of observations. So it's more more that that you test the same theory with uh, these crucial experiments of different types and that you do by different people. And if, if all fits together, then you, you conclude that this theory is adequate, you know, that the model is adequate. You know? It doesn't say whether it's true. So this is also a big difference. You know? So Plato and Epicurus were still thinking they're talking about the truth when they talked about physics or metaphysics. And in general, the trend is that, with, with few exceptions, that scientists are aware that they do models. And the only truth about it is that it's true that a certain model seems to match the observations better than other models. And that's it. But there is no claim that this means this model is anything about the truth. Yeah, that's your Pontius Pilate question about what is truth and how do you define what truth is and is truth ever attainable or not? And we're certainly not going to resolve that today or really make a lot of headway in it. But it does seem clear that maybe we can use a word like confidence. It, It does seem clear that Epicurus's position was that you can be confident of certain things after a certain amount of observation. Just like you're saying, at some point you act as if you are confident that it's going to be repeatable and you stop and move on to something else and you accept the results. And this is also related to that question that's come up in reading the A Few Days in Athens material with Frances Wright, where she says that observation is everything and theory is destructive. Unless you at some point take your observations and turn it into some kind of of a working theory, you'll never stop making observations. And in order to live your life, you have to at some point accept something as established and then act on it as if it's going to be repeatable. A lot of us have been very impressed over the years with Lucian's Alexander the Oracle Monger essay in which Lucian talks about how the Epicureans were among those who were highly skeptical of Alexander's claims of having a a supernatural snake or a supernatural dragon who could do certain things. And there's a couple of comments in that book about how what was needed was somebody like uh, an Epicurus or Metrodorus who was confident that even if they did not understand the precise means by which Alexander was misleading people and tricking people, 
they would be confident that it was trickery and that they could eventually discover the cause of the trickery at some point. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about here is that it seems to me that the direction that Epicurus ends up producing is a level of confidence in your conclusions that the world is not supernatural based, confident that you, there is no supernatural fate, confidence that there's no hell eternally after you're dead or heaven for reward. And whether you consider those conclusions to meet your definition of truth or not, you're still confident. You're not just flopping around without any position whatsoever. You take positions that you're relatively confident in are true. And the reason I relate Alexander the Oracle Monger to this is I think that's what Epicurus is doing with the physics in general. He's giving you reasons that you can have confidence in these conclusions. And whether you want to say that it's true or not, depending on your definition of truth or some other word, he's still expecting you to have confidence given these reasons in the conclusions that he's suggesting. And that's the deal about studying nature, is that he just can't say to you, believe me, there is no hell. He's got to give people some explanation as to why there's not. And when you study nature and you begin to see these uh, observations that he's making, I think that's when you begin to build that confidence that he's right in the big picture. And unless you do this kind of basic study, you never are going to be able to develop that confidence because it's always going to be, I believe it because Epicurus said so, or I believe it because some other person said so, which is not a very good grounds, I think most of us would agree, for our beliefs. Here's another point that DeWitt makes. On page 214 of DeWitt's book, he says this about the 12 principles. He says that these 12 principles were the starting point for the Epicurean program of education, whether from the little epitome, which I think he means the letter to Herodotus, or Lucretius. The truth of them was not demonstrated inductively from sensation, but established deductively and only confirmed by sensation. And then he says, if this involves a logical fallacy or a philosophical defect, it must be borne in mind that Epicurus was not constructing a theory of knowledge, but a philosophy that would serve as a road to happiness. I'm skipping a couple of sentences, but it should be borne in mind that Epicurus was not working out a psychology, but merely showing how his system, based upon principles and the practical reason and evidence, was intended to operate. He, and it says the notion of consciousness as employed in modern psychology lay outside of his problem, and so he had no need to deal with the content of consciousness. The reason I bring that up is that a lot of people, when you're reading into Epicurus, come looking for psychological help. They come looking for techniques that they can apply immediately to their method of thinking in order to live happily. But I think what DeWitt is saying here is that you're really starting here, this list of 12 principles. These are fundamentals that will eventually lead you in a direction of a psychology and counseling help and things like that. But these are not themselves psychological observations. And there's a process of reading through Epicurus in which you establish the nature of the universe and you establish a way of approaching knowledge that is then going to allow you to come up with a psychology and come up with actual almost medical types of remedies. Because once you've learned that the goal of life is happiness or pleasure, then you're much better equipped to come up with techniques to assist you rather than if you didn't even know what your goal was if you thought maybe the goal was to avoid hell or to please god or to be quote good unquote or virtuous so i wouldn't say it's necessarily a limitation of these fundamental observations about nature it's just the nature of things that we have to start somewhere and this is where in epicurean philosophy you really start you just don't start reading the ethics and the letter to Minoseus and say, this is all there needs to be known. Let's talk about that for a minute, uh, Martin. I mean, I know you, your engineering physics background, you've always been interested in these issues. What, what do you think about the issue of, can you just read the letter to Minoseus and get everything you need to know out of Epicurean philosophy? I mean, not just, it's, it's, uh, too limited on this one. It doesn't even talk much about physics. No? The, and the issue is the linkage between the physics and the ethics that's in the letter to Minoseus. 
I think certain people, like you and I would be, I think two of them, we want to know that the person who's telling us how to live our lives has an understanding of the universe that's basically the same as what we've come to. If somebody says, Martin, your goal in life is to be happy, and I know that because Zeus and Athena told me so, I would not be able to put as much credibility in their suggestions as if I understood that he had a correct, from my point of view, assessment of the nature of the universe. And I guess that's the Alexander, the Oracle monger example again, is that there's all sorts of people out there in the world who will mislead you and take advantage of you. And of course, most people say they want to be happy, no matter what religion or background or philosophy they ascribe to. Generally, it's pretty common to hear people say they want to be happy, but and that can just cover over huge differences in analysis as to how you reach that conclusion, which usually causes problems when you start trying to define what it means to be happy and to start to define what it means to pursue pleasure. If you've started from some totally different set of principles, then you're going to reach a different conclusion. If you've started with the principle that God created the universe, God created you, your goal is to do what God tells you to do, then you're going to define happiness and pleasure in a much different way than if you start with a natural, non-supernatural view of the universe. Epicurus sees a sliding scale of certainty and confidence. And earlier in the letter to Pythically, some of these observations here, maybe even all of them in this list, this list is much more certain in his mind than what's going on in the stars in the sky above us. Maybe, Martin, that's our linkage to begin to come to an end today and prepare the way back into next week for our next discussion to go back into the letter to Pythocles. Because these observations, although we cannot observe atoms directly, we can certainly observe bodies directly in front of us. But that's not something that's possible in regard to the sun or the stars or the moon or things that are the sky. We can't handle them. We can't get any closer to them by moving to a mountaintop. The difference in distance is negligible. We just don't have the evidence that we would want to have in regard to the size of the sun or other astronomical phenomena that we can see. This list of these 12 fundamental observations concerns things that we can get pretty much up close and personal to. We can't see an atom or touch an atom, but from the bodies that they form, we can be more confident in our conclusions about this set of, of fundamentals. We're not just staring at things in front of us and cataloging them. We're taking our observations and doing something with them, whether it's rules or whatever the word is that you end up coming up with. That's an understanding or insight that we need to get close and comfortable with in terms of how we're taking the observations and then using them in day-to-day life which I guess is what a worldview or a philosophy is all about. It gives you an orientation towards these things. So in the context of discussing these ideas of Epicurus, in the context of 2,500 years ago, we can treat theory, rules, fundamentals, model, all as synonymous. No? So, mm-hmm. so in the modern, we can, uh, of course, separate it out in, uh, in this context, uh, when we would rather use this word or that word, But on this higher level of discussion, on on this uh, thing uh, regarding the applicability and the consistency of Epicurus philosophy, we can uh, treat these words as synonyms. All all describing, each word will describe some sort of an aspect, but but all four uh, essentially mean the same in this context of of, of looking for this, what, what Epicurus means. All right. Well, I think we've at this point gotten to a bridge between where we went today and where we need to go for next week, because we're going to turn our observations about the sun into something else. And we're going to look at the way Epicurus phrased his assertion about the size of the sun and dig into that as deeply as we can to try to find something that's helpful to us in our day-to-day living, because that's the purpose of all of this, not to just line up observations, but to do something with those observations and use them to live better. So I'm about to conclude there, Martin. Any final thoughts from you for today? 
Oh, no, I, I think what I just said before pretty much says already what I still wanted to comment on. Okay, well, great. I think this has been a very useful interim podcast, even though it was only the two of us. We'll get this one posted as quick as we can and then have hopefully at least one or maybe even two more people with us next week to get back into the letter to Pythocles. So, okay, with that, we'll close and come back in about a week. So thank you, Martin. Thanks, and bye. Okay, bye.